We're a nation of laws, not mob rule. America is not a democracy. When Ben Franklin was asked, well, doctor, what have we got? As he left the Constitutional Convention, Franklin responded, a republic, if you can keep it. Almost 250 years after Franklin gave that answer to Elizabeth Willing Powell, we are still projecting that identity to the world. Consider this excellent description of the United States political system on our U.S. Embassy website. While often categorized as a democracy, the United States is more accurately defined as a constitutional federal republic. What does that mean? Constitutional refers to the fact that the government in the United States is based on a constitution, which is the supreme law of the United States. The Constitution not only provides the framework for how the federal and state governments are structured, but also places significant limits on their powers. Federal means that there are both a national government and governments in the 50 states. A republic is a form of government in which the people hold power, but elect representatives to exercise that power. Our founding fathers started with a fundamental assumption that every person was endowed by our creator with unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our power as individuals is grounded in our natural right to self-ownership, our individual sovereignty. And yes, this foundation was at odds with slavery, which also set the stage for its inevitable end. This foundation provided the North Star for the Constitution's limits on government power. The founders and framers of the Constitution were not being guided by the simpleton ethic that whatever is popular must be good and true. They understood the democratic electoral process to be a tool for protecting individual sovereignty from the capricious predation of the state, not an end unto itself. They were radical revolutionaries who just escaped rule by a monarch and had no interest in replacing him with a mad mob. Almost every component of the original constitutional system, some of which has since been tragically weakened or dismantled, sought to restrict what government could do to people. These are limits on what political democracy can do to people. The Bill of Rights are limits on democracy and majority rule. The First Amendment protects speech, assembly, and religion from majority rule. We are free to hold unpopular opinions and belong to unpopular groups or creeds. The Second Amendment protects the right to bear arms, even if gun ownership is unpopular. Go down the list, and each and every Congress shall pass no law should properly be understood as democratic majority rule cannot mess with this. But they went further still. They divided the government into three equal branches, the executive, judicial, and legislative, and pitted them against each other so that that competition would constrain them. In the words of James Madison, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. They split the legislative branch into a lower chamber, the House of Representatives, directly elected by voters in the district, and an upper chamber, the Senate, who were appointed by the legislatures from each state. That's right, senators were not directly elected, and there's good reason to revisit that approach, though I'll save that for another time. But the founders went further still, putting in two-thirds supermajority requirements for major decisions, impeachment, expelling members of Congress, overriding presidential vetoes, and ratifying treaties all require two-thirds majority votes. It's easy for presidents to veto a bill and much harder for the Congress to override that veto. Finally, want to make a change to the rules of the game and amend our Constitution? Good luck. No simple Democratic majority will do. It'll take three quarters of the states to ratify any amendment. All of this must be understood as limits on simple majority rule. Each and every restriction on government power is a restriction on the power of a simple 50 point something percent majority to tell everyone else what to do. By setting a much higher bar for big changes, the founders limited the randomness of arrow style paradoxes. 75% of the states might not be the will of all the people, but it's a much better guarantor that the madness of crowds isn't dominating the decision. Now, there is a counter-argument to everything I've laid out here, 
except the mathematical fact of Arrow's paradox, that is. This counterargument is the central moral claim of the populist progressive movement that kicked off in the 1890s and continues to this very day. They claim that only democratic political power exercised through government action can counteract the predation of large private power. They claim that these constraints on democracy's worst angels are archaic relics at best, and now little more than tools of the oligarchy to prevent needed radical social reform. Some go even further. Were all of the Constitution and Bill of Rights individual protections from democratic interference actually done in the name of protecting George Washington and the privileges of his elite white male cronies? Progressives have long argued, yes, and to some extent they had a point. The Constitution had compromises which allowed slavery to persist, denied slaves full rights, and left determining the right to vote up to the states, which resulted in only a few states where women could vote. Now, this late 1800s progressive movement cannot take any credit for ending slavery, but they can absolutely pat themselves on the back for delivering universal women's suffrage with the passage of the 19th Amendment. In the name of democracy, they passed the 17th Amendment, resulting in the direct popular election of senators. So yes, as we've all heard, the American progressive left has long claimed to be the champion of democracy. They are the populist counter-revolution to our democracy-skeptical founders. There's just one problem. The progressive movement did more to centralize power than ever before including in the hands of truly unelected agencies. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, who presided over the passage of both the 17th and 19th Amendments, is the poster child for progressive authoritarianism. You see, he was ultra-woke way before it was cool. Think of Wilson as the Claudine Gay of his time on bionic steroids. He too was a former Ivy League university president, a lover of centralized power a warmongering globalist who took cancel culture to the next level with the Sedition Act of 1918. Wilson was also a virulent racial essentialist who embraced eugenics and resegregated the federal government. He also screened Birth of a Nation in the White House. Wilson's ghost is surely looking down, or more likely up from beyond, at today's newly segregated college graduation ceremonies with proto-woke approval. And don't forget, Wilson created America's least democratic institution ever, the Federal Reserve. Hey, listen, party at the Fed. The most ironic thing of all, Woodrow Wilson won his first presidential election with only 41.8% of the vote, and his re-election with 49.2%. The man never got a majority. Arrow's paradox looms large. Progressives, it turns out, have been fair weather friends to democracy, but instead of constraining it in the name of individual liberty, they've preferred more abstract collective goals like equity. Democratic socialists going all the way back to Wilson competitor Eugene Debs through Bernie Sanders have long gone even further, subordinating virtually all individual rights to the right to vote. So if the majority wants to take your stuff and give it to someone else in the name of equality or any other reason that might be popular, they can do it without any constraint under that system. I still fund the rich and give to the needy. It takes a wee percentage. But I'm not greedy. Majority rules. Until it doesn't, that is, which a century of communist dictatorship has made crystal clear. Remember, power corrupts, and absolute power, popular or not, corrupts absolutely. As it turns out, the best defenders of democracy are the ones most skeptical of its moral authority. <laughs>